the opening of this week's culture class. It was by the Brian Setzer Orchestra. You probably heard it in many movie soundtracks. But the reason why I brought that up, because you know that I always like to initiate with the theme song, uh, is because it's about the glory and the excitement and the love of being an American. And I think a lot of us uh, don't feel that way right now. Um, and also other people, like people who are immigrating to the United States wanting to be an American right now. So it's just like, I don't know, the theme to get right in because the first slide that I'm actually gonna show is that uh, the public's mood right now in terms of this Pew Research poll is that just 17% say that they are proud when thinking about the state of the United States. So 17%, that's pretty crazy right now when everybody wanted to be an American before. I just wanted to help you see that viscerally. Um, so I'm gonna move forward and I just wanna reintroduce myself again. My name is Brad Grossman. This is basically the fifth culture class for the summer semester, but I've been doing this I'm calling it a culture mass class. Uh, I started doing it basically the first week of COVID, which was uh, March 18th. Well, people, uh, as you know, uh, decided, you know, we, we had the shelter in place basically on March 12th or March 13th, which was my 45th birthday. But I decided to have a free culture class on uh, the 18th and every Wednesday since then we've been having a culture class and I am the host and my name is Brad Grossman and I have a company called Zeitguide which means guide to the zeitgeist and for those of you who haven't been on or have heard me say this a million times zeitgeist is a German word that means spirit of the times and culture class is my newest product and I've been doing it uh, for companies, customizing it for them for the issues that they need to know or want to know, um, companies across all different industries. And when I'm dissecting the world of ideas and trying to keep track of the evolving narrative of culture, I'm always looking at these four big buckets of change or these four big zeitgeist pillars of change, which are global trends, tech trends, consumer trends, and workplace trends. And I always ask my students or my audience to always think about these five questions, four questions about what are you learning? Why is it relevant to you? What can you or what should you do about these learnings? And how could you integrate these trends into your own business practices, strategies, company, and sales strategy, decision-making, and life? So moving forward, uh, I just always want to start with, or I always start with what I have been feeling is the heartbeat of the week. And as you know, I started in week one, and many of you who have been in here, and again, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but every week we have new people. Uh, I always have a theme of the week, and week one was March 18th, the first time I did it. Last week, we took off. Uh, but I basically called it July 4th, the country divided. I know a lot of people uh, who have been, you know, who experienced their July 4th weekend. There were some that were on Fire Island partying. I don't know if you saw that or young people all over the beach or other people uh, in half the states where the virus is rising, uh, not social distancing, not wearing masks. And then obviously we have other conversations, whether should we uh, destroy all confederate Confederacy uh, image, whether they're statues or everywhere else, as well as the conversations about racial injustice. Um, so many other things that have been dividing America, but I'm basically saying that this week and week 17 defines the zeitgeist right now as we're in a crescendo of global discord. So last week I felt about that it was more national discord. But after reading so many things, uh, I basically illuminate or I, I read and learned about in, in literally the last three days about all the global conflicts. And that's where I'm gonna start. It's obviously gonna be very depressing, but again, this is just to help you have a snapshot of what's happening um, in terms of a global discord. I would say that 
coronavirus was, as I always say, a magnifier of all the shit that plagued our society before and an accelerator, hopefully, for the change that we really want to have. Um, and then uh, in the beginning of June, uh, after George Floyd's death, uh, we brought the conversation, which is a necessary conversation about uh, dismantling racial injustice in our uh, country and in the rest of the world. And then this week, I feel like there was another thing just thrown into the conversation what's happening, which is China, which I'm going to be discussing in a bit. And then after I go through my zeitgeist, in which I just want to say that I'm going to run through a lot of things. And, you know, usually when I do this for my premium zeitgeist classes, culture classes, or for my companies, it's a full hour and I go much more comprehensively. But I'm just have time to zip through because we have two uh, or two pieces of uh, Zeitgeist culture class towards the end, which everybody loves, which is the, ch the show and tell section where I bring in somebody who has a really, or two people in the sense, Lindsay Nkrumah Farrar, who are the founders of Crown Magazine, uh, which is a magazine for black women, uh, which is lifestyle, beauty, and fashion, but I'm going to have Nkrumah and Lindsay talk about that. That's my show and tell section. And then Felix Salmon, who's the chief uh, a financial correspondent of Axios. And those of you who have been on uh, Zeitgeist Culture Class for a while, you know that Axios is one of my favorite sources because they define the way that they report as smart brevity. And they have these amazing, amazing uh, newsletters in all different categories. Uh, Felix is being one of them. But uh, what I am, uh, I also am a proponent of smart brevity, but obviously I'm doing it live. So let's get started. I am just going to go through uh, 20 examples very quickly of what's happening in terms of the zeitgeist of the crescendo of global discord. So I already talked about <laughs> Trump versus some parts of the country. Trump's supporters versus the non-supporters and Trump and the rest of the world. And in 4th of July, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, people wearing masks or people not wearing masks. And I just wanted to illuminate actually uh, Felix from Axios. I just wanted to, you know, have this shout out because they did a poll with Ipsos that basically said that 50% of Americans report wearing a mask at all times. That's just 50%. So look at that stat. And I just wanted to add something because I know uh, Felix is also German. <laughs> this Felix, if you're there, this is an honor of you. Uh, if you missed this, uh, uh, Berlin's transport company basically is doing an ad campaign to make people wear masks by saying that people shouldn't start not wearing deodorant because then people will start wearing masks. Uh, let's keep going with the global You've zoomed. News. You've posted. Uh, uh, which was there, which was uh, Trump versus the World Health Organization. He's pulling out funding, he just said. Uh, we have just learned today that universities are suing the Trump administration's plan to require in-person classes for foreign students. So basically, they are filing a lawsuit that would basically... Uh, against saying that foreign students will not have their visas if the universities, mainly MIT and Harvard, who were part of the lawsuit, do all their learning online. So there's a division. Uh, we are all knowing that a vaccine needs to come for us to really get through this. We can eliminate uh, the contagion uh, degree by social distancing and wearing masks, but we also saw how uh, the mayor Bonhams from Atlanta actually just got it when she has been really, really, really careful as well. So we really need to fight this uh, fight for this uh, vaccine. But on the flip side, uh, it's uh, going to be more divisions between those who believe in vaccines and those who are anti-vaccine. That conversation is going to start bubbling up. And in fact, Catholic leaders are already saying that they're concerned that the COVID-19 vaccine are using cells to buy, uh, derived from human fetuses that, uh, you know, would help us all, uh, you know, be cured by the, uh, the COVID. 
uh, keep going with the global divisions. Uh, there was a report in the New York Times recently that says that Latino and African American residents are three times as likely to become infected as their white neighbors. And uh, actually black and Latino people have nearly been twice as likely to die from the virus as white people. So there you can see racial inequality. Um, here's a good thing about uh, global division. Um, because of the George Floyd protests happening here, it has spread all over the, to the rest of the world, including Africa. And Africans from Kenya, from, uh, from uh, Uganda, from Zimbabwe, from Nigeria, um, are all basically, and others, are all protesting against police brutality uh, in their countries as well. So again, it's extending out to the global. Uh, we're going against the United Nations, who are basically the United States killings of uh, General Soleimani, Soleimani of Iran. Uh, they're saying that it's unlawful. So there's another thing. Uh, yesterday, basically, our FBI uh, uh, director, Christopher Wei, basically said that uh, you know, China is a superpower. Uh, they think of themselves as being the only superpower in the particular world. Uh, here we go, in terms of the, here. Instead, China is engaged in a whole of state effort to become the world's only superpower by any means. And if you missed it, uh, Reuters basically and others reported, I saw this tweet, uh, that uh, Pompeo really is concerned about TikTok, which many of us know is uh, the new hot you know, social media app that everybody's on. It's owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance. They're trying to, they're doing a great job in terms of extending their reach to other people all over the world besides China. And uh, because ByteDance is owned by China, Pompeo is basically saying that they want everybody in the United States to stop using it. So they're showing their concerns over that. Uh, so again, now there's a division between us and China. Um, Instagram just reported that for everybody who's in uh, 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 any type of company that relies on social media, especially Instagram, Instagram is creating a new uh, app called Real. Uh, because India, because of their fight against the Chinese or the skirmishes that happen on the border, basically has banned TikTok. And this is the reason why Instagram is creating this new platform that's very TikTok-y, which I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about. Uh, they're expanding it to India. So then we have China and India. Uh, basically, and here again, Felix, uh, Axios, this is the best distillation of uh, what's happening in in, Hong, in China and Hong Kong right now, uh, where uh, there are laws, basically a security law, that's basically, I'll say it right from Axios because they so clearly define it, it's the clearest encroachment to date on the autonomy that has allowed Hong Kong to flourish as a global financial hub with political and legal protections unimaginable on the mainland. So, and they're also basically saying that if anybody speaks out against Hong Kong, I mean, uh, against China, against, uh, against China's relationship and this law against Hong Kong, they will, if you ever come to China or Hong Kong, they will investigate you. And that's a story in development as well. But Axios and many others basically also talked about how this is also impacting uh, the tech companies because um, Hong Kong uh, and the tech companies are in Hong Kong, whether it's Google, whether it's Apple, TikTok, et cetera. Um, Chinese are basically asking them to give all their data to the Chinese government. And most of the tech companies, the American-based companies, are holding back. Now, TikTok is an interesting case study because they actually said that they're going to be leaving Hong Kong which is uh, interesting. Uh, they want to be defined as other, uh, you know, as a global social media platform. And I think they've had over 300 
a million downloads since the beginning of COVID. But, uh, you know, TikTok, this is an interesting thing. They actually went further than all the other tech companies that basically have held back giving the data that the Chinese government is requesting. So here we have tech companies against China. Um, the one company that hasn't really assessed this new Hong Kong law is Apple. Now, you know, like I said, Google, Twitter, and Facebook said they're going to pause processing user data requests, but Apple has not said that they would do that yet. Uh, so again, we know how much uh, Apple uh, does business with China. In fact, they've been, you know, producing chips and all you know, hardware in China. So it makes sense. They were also very hesitant to speak about the, the Hong Kong protests during that time pre-COVID when protests were happening all over the world. Um, another division, we have been seeing a lot of advertisers boycott Facebook because of their refusal to flag the Trump quote, looting and shooting like Twitter did, and also their, uh, their, uh, uh, their dissatisfaction with uh, Facebook trying to stop the spread of, of, of hate speech and misinformation. Uh, and But that's also in conflict with a lot of direct-to-consumer brands who feel compelled that they should get off because of, of uh, all the big brands. But you know what? They, this is the only way that they can advertise. They can't afford to be on television and do other things like the big brand. So here we have a division between the philosophy between some of these big brands and some of these smaller direct-to-consumer brands. And then we, this was just been in the, in the last couple of days, but I wanted to show that the organization Stop for Hate basically recommended next steps for Facebook to actually move forward in terms of preventing this hate language from disseminating all over. And they gave 10 uh, notions of accountability. The one that I thought was most interesting that I don't think most people are talking about is that uh, they want there to be a live Facebook employee uh, and that basically can be like a customer service representative. I know everybody in brands here are really, you know, interested in how to make customer experience so, you know, better than any other brand. And, you know, this is one thing. It's about having a live employee that anybody who's experiences hate speech or anything like that or sees hate speech, they would be able to talk to somebody and actually be able to tell them what they've seen. Uh, in the tech media, there's also a big division. Again, I'm looking at all four of the buckets. Uh, there has been a lot of controversy between tech, and I'm actually interested to see what Felix has to say about this, and tech media. So there, uh, a reporter, Zoe Schiffer, from uh, The Verge reported on the fact that Away, the direct-to-consumer suitcase brand, uh, had a toxic work environment. And she wrote this article uh, which she's a reporter and she found that out. She should tell the world. I mean, that's what journalism is all about. It's the fourth estate. But there was basically a hate uh, or disagreements all over social media from not only the CEO who was criticized, who said that she was, the reporter was slandering, but also that uh, the venture capitalist who put money into the company is basically saying how disgraceful uh, the, the, the journalist was. Another division, I talked about facial recognition technology and how IBM and, uh, and some other Microsoft said they were gonna stop facial recognition technology because of their fear of uh, you know, privacy issues. And Apple basically said that they're not gonna do that yet. Uh, and they're actually creating the, the facial scanning situ uh, technique or capability in their new home kit. So you see Apple versus some of the other big tech companies. And uh, I'm just gonna go through the remaining and then we're gonna go with our Zeit guests. I'm really excited. Here's, we've been hearing about Congress's uh, desire to regulate the big tech companies. Uh, so you have big tech versus Congress. Um, and this actually is going to happen in July 17th, uh, where uh, they're going to have to go to Washington and, uh, you know, they're going to hear them to see if they are being too monopolistic. Uh, and uh, 
even Hamilton there showed some division. Uh, there were people who were saying that Lin Manuel, the creator of Hamilton, and by the way, it was a huge success on uh, Disney Plus. Uh, I think they uh, increased uh, by yeah, like a like their 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 curve went like this when even Netflix went like this, which was insane. Uh, but people were criticizing Lin Manuel, who basically reconstitutes the Hamilton and the founding father story uh, by casting black and brown actors. My, many of us know that. I'm sure many of you have uh, decided to download Hamilton. But they uh, Lin Manuel was basically criticized for uh, for. Uh, not really talking too much about the slavery issue with the founding fathers. And basically he retorted that he said that, you know what, uh, you know, I did the best I can. So even like Lin-Manuel is getting pushback. So look at all these crazy division. It's not just one polarization. And I really do think the next conversation is going to be about uh, the PPP. Now, Cindy Gallup who was on a couple weeks ago who taught us all about how to and racism in the corporate world, uh, the, PP, uh, the, the PPP loans were just announced today. The SBA basically published every single company that got a PPP loan. And most of those on there were big brands and companies and startups that were owned by, uh, or companies owned by men uh, and white people. And, you know, Cindy Gallup basically talked back and basically said, you know, black and color female founders, you know, you will be burning red hot with rage uh, when you see the, the amount of companies and the juxtaposition and the percentage of who got it, who didn't. I feel that there's next going to be a boycott against all these big brands who basically took these big loans um, and the other people or the smaller companies, small businesses haven't been able to get it. So I am seeing those divisions everywhere. And this was all, uh, all, oh, by the way, 74% increase in subscriptions on Disney Plus. That was the number I had a brain fart. Uh, so uh, that being said, I uh, made a list <laughs> of everything I just covered. So feel free to uh, snapshot it. <laughs> to make you feel really excited about where the world is going. I'm gonna scroll through this so people could take snapshots. But these, and there's so many others. I mean, even before COVID, we had like around 30 countries all over the world protesting. So the world was on fire pre-COVID, I kept saying that, but look where it is today. And it's division across all those sectors, global, in our country, in technology, geopolitically, consumer-wise, and the conversations about work. So uh, this is a good segue uh, into the next subject, which you know is a lead-in because there was a, a uh, an article, basically. <laughs> wow, the scroll uh, that another division. There is this conflicted cultural force in in, ba in black publishing, and. Uh, Dovetailing with that, uh, I'm really grateful that we have the founders in our show and tell segment, uh, Lindsay and Nakruma Farrar, and uh, they are from Crown Magazine, and here it is, and uh, it is a, um, I'll let them explain it, but here are some images. Um, it's basically a magazine for Black women, and uh, it's print. And it's really beautiful. And uh, I actually learned about Lindsay when uh, I saw an editorial she wrote, which I covered in Culture Class a couple weeks ago. And uh, Lindsay, you know, who's the editor in chief of Crown, uh, contextualized, you know, the importance of Black media, Black publishing. Uh, and um, I'm so honored to have her and her husband and her partner, uh, Nakruma. Uh, here to talk about Crown in our show and tell section. So uh, let me unshare the screen. And Lindsay Nakruma, are you there? Yes. Hello. Hey. Hey, thanks, Brad. Thanks for having us. And 
very informative uh, beginning of the day mm -hmm. or of the class. I mean, I mean, I mean I'm j that's what I kind of do. I'm trying to <laughs> deal everything so no, so people could just read Axios and watch Culture Class. Uh, <laughs> of course, there's so much there, and I have to go deeper. But you know, in the sake of time, here we are. Mm -hmm. um, so, tell me about Crown. Yeah, so tell everybody here about Crown and your the purpose for Crown and uh, what it is, the story. Well, I'm just gonna sit back and listen, and okay. so is everybody else. Clearly, so <laughs> yeah, on mute. mute. Co-founders of Crown Magazine. Um, I'm the editor in chief, and Nakuma is the chief creative. Uh, and we are on a mission to be the most beautiful and honest representation of Black women in the history of print no small feet. <laughs> we set the bar very high. Just print, um, not, not digitally. Uh, we, are, we're, we are print first. So we started off um, with Me a too, little- as, as you know, I was- always, <laughs> Right, well, I have, and I have a couple. We have a, a literary journal, which is about 130 to Beautiful. 160 pages, and a mag, which is a little more bite-sized and digestible. Um, and the uh, editorial that you reference is, is in this one. Yeah, um, show that in a sec. Well, I showed it. I, I would like you to talk about it in a second. But t tell me more about Crown. So why did you create it? Um, we really, this was the end of 2014. Um, and we had a conversation that was a very casual conversation. I was in uh, New York living in Brooklyn at the time. And Nkrumah was still on the West Coast, which is where we're both from, where we met and just started having a conversation about uh, really the prospect. Really, we were in transitions in our careers and started, it was just one of those moments where it all kind of just, a conversation started. We started talking about print. I'm like, are you crazy? You know, uh, a lot of our backgrounds came together and um, just looking at the climate at that time and the idea that Black women were really redefining beauty standards for themselves in real time, particularly in the YouTube space, so in the digital space, um, and having a conversation about what would that look like if we were to immortalize that experience in a print form, um, really informed by the fact that we know from our experience as Black people, we are very, we've been terribly represented, um, particularly in print, in a tangible way um, for centuries. And so we, we thought it would be a really interesting way to build a direct to consumer brand um, around something that is physical in a digital age in a way to immortalize the story and this phenomenon that we were in the midst of. And, you know, kind of fast forward, what, six years now, um, we see ourselves in a very interesting time, um, in a time with, with very heightened sensitivity to race relations, obviously, um, in a time where, you know, there's now the Crown Act where people are trying to legislate racism away and to, to make it legal or illegal to discriminate against people based on their hair. And so we really started um, the conversation around this psychographic conversation around natural hair um, because so many women were taking, taking this moment to say, no, I'm not gonna wear a weave or uh, chemically relax my hair, which puts chemicals straight into my scalp, I'm going to wear my hair natural. And so it was really, that was a big part of that YouTube um, phenomenon was you're seeing these rituals that would normally be in, the, in like the intimacy of your home with your mom or your sister. Now they're broadcast across the globe. And so really uh, formalizing that conversation. And there was also, you know, Crown was started in direct response uh, to a need there was a, a hole in the market in the sense that black women are amongst the, the most educated, it's, black women as a group are amongst the most educated in the country. But when you look at the media diet offered to black women, it's celebrity and gossip driven and, and also very poor representations of at least the black women in our communities and in our families um, that we knew. And we wanted to create something that engaged black women in higher thought mm -hmm. you know we have all these, these but what have they been getting before your magazine or two questions can you compare yours to one that you actually respect in terms of media uh that has been before crown 
And what is the antithesis to uh, what you're seeing in, I guess, in the marketplace pre crime I mean, in general, Black women have been hypersexualized, um, and the the representations that we've seen, particularly on on TV, is just just a mess. Like it just does not represent. If if you you know if you if you especially for an international audience looking at American media, the opinion that they would form that you, that you could form of black people based on what is presented, you would perceive us as criminals, as sexual deviants, as uh, uneducated, as poor, and it's ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of like making a, a, a comparison to to something that we respect, it would be hard to do in a in a contemporary context. But you know, in the past, Ebony and Jet have provided have chronicled his, the history of the Black American experience and have provided a range of representations for Black people. Right, and at the time we were starting, I I'm not sure. Well, Jet is no longer. Um, Ebony, sure, yeah. I believe, was doing some things. I'm not sure. Um, Essence Magazine was not, was owned by Time Inc. And so it's, it's, there was, there was a definite void in terms of uh, the conversation that we were looking to have. And what is the conversation you want to have? Uh, well, to Nekroma's point, it's really engaging Black women in higher thought. So it's having conversations that are beyond just hair, beyond just beauty, beyond mm -hmm you know, surface conversations and reaching, um, reaching for depth of representation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's not something that you can um, put in a listicle. Okay. <laughs> but are there uh, maybe, you know, this latest issue? What are some yeah. of the stories? Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is our money and power issue. Um, and some of the conversations that we have are reparations. Um, one of the titles is why I just turned down a million dollars. And it's a founder talking about, you know, having a million dollar investment on the table, but the terms were terrible. You know, and predatory why capital and uh -huh. some, what, 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 some of the things that we experience as entrepreneurs, um, it, operating in a racist environment. Mm -hmm. you know. um, the road to freedom, wielding black political power with uh, Karen Hunter, who has a, a very popular show on Sirius XM. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how to quit your day job, uh, the things that, you know, Black women are, again, highly educated, also the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in this country have been so for some years now. Um, but the fact remains that our community has very little wealth when it, when you look at all of the numbers and the figures, we talk about that. Yeah. Um, we own very little land, uh, even when we are the fastest group of a uh, growing group of entrepreneurs, our sales are, you know, are very slight as compared to our counterparts. Uh, many of our businesses don't even employ an employee. And, and it's how, like, what does that even mean? We, you know, it's dissecting and interrogating those things, um, which for a fashion or beauty magazine would not really be on the table. But for us, those are the, those are the things that are, allow us to access our true power. And then, you know, beauty and all that stuff is cute. And it's, and it's the <laughs> audience are black women, you're saying. So do you right. see it going on beyond to a, another audience? This is, that's an interesting question to me. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the problems in media and in creating black media is that most of the, the black media offered to the world is stories or content about black people for white consumption. Uh -huh. And that is to say that it's it's black storytelling, but made palatable for, for the world instead of telling the story for, for a specific audience and just allowing the world to enjoy it. And so the magazine is, is much in that vein. Like this magazine is very specifically for black women, but smart white women all across mm -hmm. the country subscribe and learn a lot. From the magazine mm -hmm. and black men right. but 
but yeah, I mean, especially in these in these last uh, several weeks, we've gotten a, an influx of interest and in, in purchases from people outside of the target market, so to speak, but have been very thankful and have been very, um, just had very positive feedback. Like I learned so much because we're not trying to speak to or dice or uh translate it's more, we're te we're speaking to ourselves we're reflecting our experience and our reality and if you are genuinely interested in understanding i think it, it is a very um it would be a very useful tool mm -hmm. and a very uh important conversation because it, it's it's really like people are like what can i do to help how can i what, you know yeah. it's just this moment where you, it's hard to understand. And a lot of that is listen, you know? But, you know, what do you think about everything that is going on right now in corporate America? I mean, uh, uh, are, are we all doing enough? Um, no. Well, <laughs> right. <laughs> Short to put it frankly, no. Um, I mean, I, I left, I, I felt forced out of corporate America. Yeah. The culture was not compatible. Um, and I found much more success as an entrepreneur, as a lot of my contemporaries have, or have tried and are, are but they, they feel as though, man, I'm underpaid. It's a toxic work environment. I have to go to therapy just to make it through all of these lists of things. I, I might as well try to do something else. And that's the current climate that we have. And that doesn't change because we post a bunch of social media posts. It's about the systems that are in place. It's about the cultures that are in place. It's, it's about the tokenism, the feelings of black women and black people in these organizations that are not empowered to make change, that are not empowered even really to do their jobs half the time, um, aren't empowered to, you know, you bring in a black vendor and they're questioning you if you have a, an existing relationship with this person, all of those types of things. And those things don't change overnight. And it's interesting, like the converse, it's interesting how, how these conversations are framed uh, because they're not had in from a, a position of, or in a context of equity. Like, you know, even when we're talking about uh, more tolerant and more healthy work environments and cultures inside of companies, we're talking about better conditions inside of white owned companies. But the challenge is for white people in corporate to look around the room and say, hey, have I ever worked for a big company that was owned by a black man? Have I ever worked under and directly reported to a black CEO? Have I ever worked in a room and been the minority in the room? And the answer is always gonna be no, particularly in businesses like advertising and media. And that's those are some of the questions that we need to be posing and, and then the next thing is why is that the case and part of part of the reason is obvious uh being that you know as Lindsay, Lindsay mentioned you know we did an article on predatory capital and you know gen more generally speaking our lack of access to capital and yeah. then when we do have access the terms of, of engaging that capital are just ridiculous Okay, I, gosh, I, I, as I keep developing culture class, I'm like, I, I, I want to do it for two hours, but uh, <laughs> I don't really have the time. Uh, there's so much to talk about. And I know Jarvis, Jarvis, you say hi, you know, you're the associate producer helping me tighten this up. Uh, and he's putting quotes for everybody. Uh, and uh, why don't you type in for everybody uh, to tell them where they could get Crown Mag. And I hope everybody on this call uh, subscribes. I wish you the best. Tough times for everybody, even with the COVID, I'm sure, and being an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur, it's tough. So uh, I wish you the best and uh, thank you so much. Thanks yeah. for your time. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us. Song. Thanks, Jarvis. All right. So uh, we're going to move on to the media conversation. And uh, I this I'm gonna share the screen for one second again because this is the hearts and minds segment. Felix Salmon, uh, who's been a journalist for so many years and has been 
uh, on my radar forever. He's, uh, he just says it how it is, and that's why I'm excited to have him here. Uh, as you can see, Axios is one of my favorite, favorite uh, uh, sources to get content. And uh, I know the people there, including uh, you know, the, the, the founders, and they are all looking at news and media in a really interesting, innovative way that all makes us smarter, faster, better, et cetera. So uh, I wanna talk about media today. I wanna talk about some of the things that Felix has been uh, thinking about, because he's thinking about all the time. And if you follow him on Twitter at FelixSalmon.com, uh, every second he has something to say. So uh, Felix, thanks for being here. I'm just gonna show your, uh, the site on Axios, which basically can illuminate uh, you know, just some of the stories that you've written in the last few weeks. And you also have a podcast, right, Felix? Are you there? Slate Money School. Find it wherever you get your podcast. And at uh, Axios.com, you could sign up uh, to uh, Felix's Axios newsletter. Edge is the name of the newsletter, yeah. Yes, and it comes out every Thursday. Yes. Felix, can I ask you a question? Because there's always, do you have time to go over? It's fine if you don't. Yeah, yeah sure. All right, cool. All right. So everybody cancel your uh, meeting afterwards and uh, let's have some fun. All right, Felix, uh, I'm going to stop share so we can see you. Uh, thanks. Hello. Good haircut, by the way. Did you? Do <laughs> <laughs> and where are you right now? Uh, downtown Manhattan. Oh, I'm in Manhattan now too. Oh, by the way, I love doing this. If everybody could just type in where you're from, we have like almost 40 people on today, which is amazing. So type in chat where you're from. I love doing that. All right, Felix. So Axios, why don't you explain what Axios is if I didn't do it just? I think you did a perfectly good job. It's, right? it's basically, we, we look at the world and we tell you everything that you need to know and nothing that you don't need to know in the minimum amount of time that we can uh, just squeeze it all into. And what gave Mike and the other partners, and you know, you're probably an early uh, hire as well, uh, or partner, maybe. Uh, everybody's a partner, right? Uh, we're, we're all shareholders. Uh, I don't know if we're partners. Uh, well, good. Uh, the, the good luck. Um, I'm sure you'll all succeed. So what is the reason why Axios came into being? What was like the white space that the founders saw? Um, basically, I think it was the, the, the founders mostly came from Politico and Politico, as you know, has, is a very fast twitch and it's like, you know, who won the morning, who won the afternoon, what, what's the latest micro scoop? And it's really great if you're a political junkie or you really care about that kind of thing, but it's way too insidery for the vast majority of people. And it's also a relatively narrow um, subject matter. I think what they, what they re realized was that in a world where there's just enormous amounts of information, um, there's a real need that people have to just get taken straight to what matters. Um, Mm -hmm. And don't give me anecdotal leads, don't give me narratives, don't give me long discursive stories. Just tell me what I need to know, tell me what's new, tell me why it matters, and then let me get on with my life because I am busy. And if you can get me caught up on stuff super quickly, there's just, uh, in, in a very reliable way and in a scoopy way that like will break news as well as just tell you what other people are saying. Then, right, you're not aggregating, you're actually doing Well, we are aggregating, we, we do both. You and, do both. And, and like the, the, in a weird way, the audience doesn't care whether you broke the news or not, right? It's important to be out there well sourced in the world so that you understand what's going on and who to believe and who to trust and who not to believe. Like, you know, whenever there's a White House scoop, like six times out of seven, probably Jonathan Swan will be on slack saying yeah don't ignore this one it's crap because we have the expertise necessary to be able to do that um but by the same token if something important does happen we're going to be out there saying this is important this is why it matters we're not we're not going to sort of ignore it just because we didn't break it 
our mantra is very much reader first. And so we'll give you what you need to know. And a huge, huge part of that is not giving you what you don't need to know. Um, that and what we do don't print is massively do you, important. How do you distinguish between the two, what you need to know and what you don't need to know? Um, just like, by, we, we have one question which we try to apply to everything we write, which is why it matters. Like, tell me something, then tell me why it matters. What you often find with a lot of stories um, is that if you ask yourself, why does this matter? You don't really come up with a very compelling answer. And so if you can't answer why, why the why it matters question in a very sort of concise and compelling way, that's a really strong indication that the story probably doesn't matter and that maybe the audience doesn't need to, we, we don't need to use up our audience's precious time by, by, by inflicting it upon them. So yeah, so that you have to understand why it matters, basically, and why it matters in terms of like the reader or just, you know, how, like, how do I'm good, I would just want to dig one step deeper. How do you figure out if it matters or not? Well, I mean, we have different users which cover different industries. So, you know, it might be why does it matter to this industry? It might mean why does it matter to the reader? Um, you know, I'm a financial journalist by trade and I um, am naturally mistrustful of this, of, of this trope that you find a lot of business journalism, which is like, well, why, why does this matter to the reader? Like, you know, I'll, I'll be writing about like, um, you know, the structure of the yield curve or something like that. And this is like important stuff, which, which helps to govern the growth of the economy and the, and, and, and the whole world, but like, not everything needs to come back to sort of like who's going to be the next president or, um, you know, how much money I'm going to make. It doesn't need to be personally important, but it does need to have some kind of an impact on the world that really matters and makes a difference. All right. So let's shift to some of the stories that you've been working on. I showed a few. Uh, what are some of the things that are really top of mind for you right now that you really want to find out and know what matters for your audience? Um, so one of the things I'm really looking at right now is this new law um, that China has promulgated in Hong Kong and the effect that that may or may not have on, not only on Hong Kong, but basically on any company in the world that does business in China, which is virtually every country. So certainly every big company in the world. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's, there's this provision for law, which basically says that it applies to everyone on the planet. It applies to you, it applies to me, even if we're here in the United States, for whatever country we're in, whatever passport we hold, we are subject to this law and um, we can break this law. Now, in practice, if we break this law by posting, you know, pro-democracy sentiments on Twitter, say, from the comfort of our couch in Manhattan, uh, there's no Chinese SWAT team is going to come down on, you know, from helicopters and arrest us. But if at any point we ever do go to China, and most of us do go to China, um, you know, every so often, COVID notwithstanding, right. at that point, we will be criminals because we will have broken the law. We will have broken Chinese law and they can arrest us. Now, the fact is the Chinese can arrest anyone in China for just about any reason or no reason. They've been doing that with Canadian nationals recently, as I'm sure you know. Um, but this is an escalation of that. And it's part of what you, uh, linked to previously from the FBI, basically saying that the Chinese are trying to um, use every tool at their disposal, at disposal to, to become the second hegemonic power in the world. And having this kind of degree of extraterritoriality built into their legal system is definitely part of um, how the US projects its power globally. And it looks like it might become part of how the Chinese project their power globally as well. You said in Axios, I don't think it was you, but maybe it was Brittany who does it. She does the China. Beat. Bethany. Bethany. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, she talked about a story about how there was like a Chinese student who tweeted or said something, uh, a Chinese student in America or student in America from China who said something against the Chinese government. And then when he went back, he was arrested. Is that something that- right. and, you yeah. don't, and you don't even need to be Chinese. Like, yeah, they don't, like, as long as you're 
in China, they can arrest you. Right. As long as you're in, so if I say something and I go to China, they could arrest me, basically. Right. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> so, all right. So uh, what are some of the other things that's on your mind right now? Um, so I, I was actually very interested in what you said about the, the PPP, because I think there's this really interesting um, sort of perceptions gap when it comes to the PPP that you were like, well, look at the people who got it and the people who didn't get it and look who the, like who managed to get the money and the people who are left out. And, um, and there is a very broad sense, I think when, you, you know, yesterday there was a lot of talk about the people who got it and, and they were like, and there a lot of the rhetoric surrounding that was like, um, think who got this money, who, who, you know, the, the more, the needier people who could have received this money and didn't, uh, um, which I think is all based on a bunch of chaos that happened at the beginning of the rollout uh, yeah. before it was re-upped. Um, the fact is, the, the fact is, there's 130 billion dollars left over in the PPP. That basically everyone who applied for it got it. Um, that you do not have a large number of people who like were left out, who didn't get it, who wanted it and weren't able to apply. Like that, you, it is is it's is it always possible to find one or two here or there, sure. But like, you don't have a there. There was in the end no fiscal constraint on this. They they had more money than they knew what to do with, and and they've extended it even further in the hope that more people will apply for it. Um, so. But, but like, it's very easy to turn all of these things into a kind of zero sum game and say, well, yeah, um, look at all these rich people, Kanye and people like that who, who applied for the PPP. And it's like, well, yeah, he did. Um, but that doesn't mean that like he got money that would have otherwise gone to someone, someone else because there's like a whole bunch of money left over. But we are in this very kind of feverish time right now in this febrile time of COVID where everyone is feeling particularly righteous about particular about more or less everything. And so, yeah, I think that, that it was almost inevitable that when the list of names came out, there was going to be like a, uh, a bunch of righteousness on Twitter from the likes of Cindy Gallup. Okay. So you, you disagree with her? I, I mean, I think she's just factually wrong. Because you're saying everybody who basically applied was able to get it. And, yeah. Okay. Uh, what about, so what, I got a couple emails about people who were, you know, upset that the big brands got some when they didn't really need it. Is that? I, I have no idea which big, big brands you're talking about. There, there was a handful of restaurant chains who got it, but that right. was about it. Right. Okay. Um, any other stories? Any other things on your mind? What do you think about, like, what's in your heart and mind right now about the whole COVID situation? I mean, we've seen, like, I keep saying- well, As I say, I think, I, think, I think we're super, super feverish right now. I think we're super, like, uh, there, there was, uh, what's his name? Dolnik in the New York Times today was talking about parentheses and, um, and how, like, we're in this weird, we, we, it feels like, someone opened a parenthesis and we have no idea when or how it's going to be closed, right? We're, we're in this liminal state and liminal, liminal states, liminal. but yeah. Yeah, what's a liminal? So, so I don't know if you know much about rites of passage and this guy, Arnold Van Gennep, who, who, um, who more or less came up with the idea, but whenever you have a major transition in, in life, there's nearly always a rite of passage associated with it. You have the pre-state and then you have the rite of passage and then you have the post-state. And the rite of passage, whether it's like, you know, a wedding or a bar mitzvah or, uh, you know, you name it, some kind of weird, um, you know, ritual where you go out into the desert for 40 days and almost die, whatever it is, um, it has a very clearly defined end. And the, and the ceremony itself, the, the, the liminal state, the in-between state is kind of uncomfortable. No one feels very natural during it. And they all kind of breathe a sigh of relief when it's over, right? You know, when, like, if you go to a wedding and the, priest, and, and, and the officiant says, well, you may now, now kiss the bride, like, there's this big sort of sigh of, oh, phew, like, that's done, that's over, now we can go party, because, like, we've, we've got to the end, we've got to the other side. And 
what we're experiencing right now is a really uncomfortable feeling of being in the middle of this state with no end in sight. And we have no idea when we're going to be able to sort of exhale and go back to normal or whether that's going to be the case or how that's going to be the case. And so everything is fraught, everything is extremely emotional, everything has become very righteous. And there have been definitely positive aspects of that, you know, like the whole broad embrace of Black Lives Matter would never have happened, I don't think, without that kind of feeling uh, that, that that emotionality that the, the 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 country is on edge like there's a massive difference as you know in the broad social acceptance of black lives matter among white folks compared you know in 2020 versus 2014 when it started um and so that's good but there's just also this much broader feeling of of, of feverishness in the country as a whole and the world as a whole but mostly in the countries where COVID is still raging, like the UK and the US and in Brazil, um, where you, you kind of feel like um, anything is possible in a kind of um, dangerous way. And I think there's, there's much more danger in the world. I don't know if you've seen the, like the, the shooting stats are way up, the homicide yep. stats are way up. Um, yeah, so it, it's a very, very uncomfortable state to domestic be in. And abuse, I think that is domestic um, abuse, like, you know, mental health issues, domestic abuse. And yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that I think is is this sort of like background noise to everything else that's going on right now. And it's, it's important to just kind of look at the world through that lens and realize how incredibly unusual and artificial the current situation is. And is there any hope? No, I mean, I, we're not going to get out of this until like we close the parenthesis. Uh, and that's not going to happen until we have some kind of herd immunity through a vaccine. And, uh, and no one has a clue like when that might happen, how that might happen, how we're going to get enough doses of the vaccine, how we're going to persuade people to take the vaccine. All of these things are, are, are deeply unknown. But like, what is clear is that we have absolutely no hope or plan for reducing the prevalence of the virus in, 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 in society. Like every other country has been able to do it pretty much, but we haven't. What is your opinion why or why not? Um, I, it, it's because we have a weak and untrusted federal government. Like right. it, it, there, there were a million things the federal government could and should have done and didn't do. Uh, um, and yeah, the, the fault really lies with them. Okay. I'm also really interested in some of the stuff that you've been talking about in terms of um, the Jeffrey Epstein. You were kind of like on that very, or like what, what, I mean, it's such a story and it's in your world, but if you're on Axios Edge and you're talking about, and there's so many different, you have such a broad scope of the subjects, but why, was that like an obsession for you? Did that come from your own volition that you wanted to, because you did an amazing job and you really illuminated really what that whole thing was about. And so- Yeah, and, and, and you know, obviously the, 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 the second shoe, we're gonna see how much the second shoe drops now that Ghislaine Maxwell has been arrested. Um, I mean, literally I'm looking out my window. You can't see my window because you're looking at me, but if you could see what I'm looking at, I'm looking at the, the MCC, the, the jail where Epstein killed himself or didn't depending on what you believe um the uh <laughs> well you're doing you, know. <laughs> you don't have to say <laughs> um but yeah the there's I, i've been fascinated by the by the epstein brothers for for many years i spent a lot of time investigating and writing about cooper union which is this college here in downtown manhattan where the chairman of the board was Mark Epstein, Jeffrey's brother. And there was a lot of financial shenanigans going on there. And no one really understood where Mark got his money. And there was a lot of people talking about Jeffrey even back then. And so, yeah, I, I kept on following those things. I had a few connections at the MIT Media Lab. And so that whole story blew up and I was, I was interested in that. Um, it turned out that Jeffrey Epstein was basically making donations to the media lab by sort of 
laundering them through Leon Black and Bill Gates, which is a crazy story, um, which I think has gone really unexamined. What is absolutely astonishing to me is that although Prince Andrew has sort of suffered the consequences or suffered some consequences for palling around with Jeffrey Epstein, a lot of other very, very rich and important men like Leon Black, like Bill Gates, like Larry Summers, like the list goes on and on, who have very documented relationships with this guy, um, seem to have suffered no ill effects whatsoever, which is kind of amazing. Yeah, so that'll be a story that you're going to continue now that Glenn was just arrested. Uh, for anybody who doesn't really understand that story, uh, or not into it, uh, Jeffrey Epstein was somebody who was accused for sex trafficking and raping underage women and having this relationship with many rich and powerful men uh, and actually, you know, worked with a woman named Glenn Maxwell, who was his uh, person who sought out and, and trained these women. He went to jail and like Felix said that he either uh, killed himself or whatever you believe, a very rich man uh, but I know many of the people on the call might not know this. So if you want, just uh, you know, read Felix's work. The other story that I just think is really interesting that you, uh, you know, that you mentioned. Everybody's talking about Facebook, right? And the Facebook boycott. I mentioned it as well from brands, right? You said something really interesting uh, about how, and I read in your newsletter about how. Brands are actually, they might use this time or see if actually Facebook is effective. Am I getting, getting that right? In yeah, brand, like, brands have, have been very suspicious about social media in general and Facebook in particular for some time now. It's never really proven itself as a great place for brand advertisers. And brand advertisers are not actually that important to Facebook. The top 100 yeah. advertisers only account for about 6% of Facebook's ad revenue. The vast majority of advertisers on Facebook are like small local businesses, or as you say, like D2C companies, which don't have the budget to really do big brand advertising. But once you grow to that big size of being able to do brand advertising and wanting to do brand advertising, um, Facebook becomes something which you kind of feel like you have to be on it but you, you don't really quite understand why and and every so often you'll find um companies like adidas or procter and gamble coming out and saying well we just slashed like 200 million dollars off our social ad spend and it had no visible effect on anything and i don't know why we're bothering to spend it um or like you know google search ad spend or that kind of stuff a lot of the money that is being gobbled up by the duopoly by Facebook and Google um, is really, you know, it's, it's long tail stuff and the brands I think are becoming increasingly suspicious of it. And so when you had color of change and the anti-defamation league and all of these other people, sleeping giants coming along to the brands and saying, you, we want you to boycott Facebook for the month of July, they were really pushing at an open door. A lot of these brands were like, yeah, well, that's a great idea. We'll boycott Facebook for the month of July and it'll be a great natural experiment to see if anything actually changes and if it hurts us at all. And there's a good chance that it really won't. Do you think individuals are gonna boycott Facebook now? Or do you think it's just something, because you know, we heard today that uh, you know, people who are running civil rights groups, et cetera, are, don't think Facebook's doing enough. In fact, Facebook, they had this meeting, right? And they, right. And they basically failed. Right. what they wanted uh so do you think that this will transfer not just with brands but consumers in terms so of there's there's been like low level i i know dozens of people who aren't on facebook or who deleted their facebook accounts but this is before. You know, i'm sure you do too yeah right <laughs> and 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 this is this has never been enough to you know move the needle in terms of facebook i think I think there's this um, fallacy when it comes to boycotts that like the way that a boycott works is that everyone joins the boycott. No one, you know, has, does any business with the, with the company being boycotted, the company being boycotted thereby loses lots of business, loses lots of revenue, gets crippled 
crippled and that has to change, change its ways or go out of business. And like, that is really not how boycotts have ever worked. Like with the possible exception of um, like a bo the boycott on, on, on South African goods in, in the 1980s during apartheid, like that for, for normal companies, that's not really, that's really not how it works. It's, it's much more of a PR campaign. It's not a bottom line thing. And the, that there's like, people are welcome to delete, delete their Facebook accounts. So it won't really make any difference to Facebook's revenues because the fact is Facebook knows who you are, whether you have a Facebook account or not. Um, my, my former colleague, Kashmir Hill has written a lot about this and people who have never had Facebook accounts, let alone people who've deleted their Facebook accounts, still get ads targeted at them every day um, by Facebook and Facebook knows exactly who they are and they know exactly who their friends are and you know what their social graph is everyone is everyone is indexed by facebook at this point whether you have a facebook account or not and i think a lot of people don't realize the degree to which you are exposed to facebook to, to ads that ultimately make facebook money even if you never download the app you never go to facebook.com you never you know even if you never go to instagram like people a lot of people don't even realize that instagram is owned by facebook but even if you never and what's any of those apps, right whatsapp well whatsapp is owned by facebook but it so far doesn't have advertising so it's not a major revenue source of facebook what it does do is it helps facebook understand those social graphs so if you're like on a whatsapp group with a bunch of face with a bunch of friends who are on facebook then Facebook can use that information to sort of triangulate you and your device and work out that when you visit a website and they'll serve you an ad on a completely unrelated website, that they'll know exactly who you are, who your friends are, what your interests are, what kind of ad to serve you. So yeah, like the idea that boycotting Facebook is, is, is like a, something that's gonna harm Facebook, I think is, is, is another one of those fallacies that people don't really understand. I, one last subject because like we're on that. Uh, what do you think about what's going to happen with the the desire of regulations and to break up these big tech companies? Do you have an opinion on that? Well, yeah, I think. I mean, I think that's definitely the direction that we're moving in. Certainly not under this administration, but potentially under the next one. Um, you know, Facebook does get a huge amount of monopoly value from owning Instagram and WhatsApp and Google gets a huge amount of monopoly value from owning YouTube and, you know, Google maps. And so like, if you break those things up and you start creating competition in between them, competition for advertisers, competition for users, um, that can only be helpful. It, it's not obvious to me that that would be harmful to anyone. Um, and it would help to, break up some of the obscene scale that these massive global companies have you know um you know we live in a world where people sort of mutter under their breath about someone like twitter oh, only has three or four hundred million users that's nothing that's not real scale you can't really compete with that in order to be a real force in social you need to have a billion users or two billion users or something completely insane like that and that just cannot be healthy you become having you, you, you wind up with a degree of power that's almost greater than many sovereign states. Because, you know, there's no, there's literally no country in the world that has as many people as Facebook has users. That's really Not even China. How many users do they have right now, Facebook? Well, it depends how you count, but it's, it's definitely in the billions. Huh. And so what do you think about TikTok then? in terms of, are they like a, could they grow as big as Facebook? It seems like their audience is growing. Well, I mean, yeah, the gro growth is easy. To get to Facebook scale, no, you can't get to Facebook scale from, from TikTok alone. Um, and they're certainly not gonna get to Facebook scale if they're banned in India, which they are. Right. And also they've never actually um, been in China, which is something I think a lot of people don't understand. Like TikTok is, it used to be an, an app called Musical.ly, which yep. was bought by ByteDance and then it got rebranded as TikTok. Um, ByteDance, the parent company, has a very similar app in China, whose name I forget. Um, and they basically took that software and that algorithm and they 
ported it onto the Musical.ly base. But TikTok has no users in China and it's now been banned in India. Those are the two most populous countries in the world. So no, TikTok is not going to become as big as Facebook. It's impossible. Could, could you explain why they decided not to, uh, uh, why, why to end their, you know, the, the platform in Hong Kong just recently? Right, because because Hong Kong is now, ever since this new law came in, Hong Kong is basically the mainland. It's basically China. The whole one country, two system, one country, two systems thing has gone right out the window. And so, um, and so if you're not in China, then you shouldn't be in Hong Kong. So since they're not in China, they were like, we're, we're getting out of Hong Kong too. Interesting, interesting. So they really are defining, like you said, that ByteDance is... Like, so China has access to ByteDance information, but ByteDance owns TikTok, but TikTok's not in China. So it's, it's pretty confusing, right? So Mike Pompeo is hinting very strongly that China has access to all of the data on TikTok users. TikTok, you know, vehemently denies this and says it's not true and that all of the information is held in the United States and uh, there's all manner of firewalls and that China has no access to it at all um and so you know believe who you want on that one but you know much more about tiktok this than i do because it's run by your friend kevin oh, <laughs> kevin mayer uh yeah disney yeah we'll see i mean he's basically telling you know the united states government that you know it's a great platform and they're not doing anything giving anything to china so you know he just he just had a statement that was just released i think yesterday so, Do you believe him? I don't know. I'm not, no comment. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody believes anybody right now, right? <laughs> We're kind of like in this world of distrust. Nobody knows what's happening. Uh, so last question, which is a, a positive question that's uh, being uh, asked by Erica Berger, uh, who is also a journalist. And she is wondering if you are all hiring and i know this isn't your job but are you hiring a head of social good partnerships and impact no no no, no. she's saying that TikTok is doing that oh so are you oh thank you so is TikTok going to do yeah no <laughs> yeah, no this is this is, out loud. This, is Sorry. this is kevin this is kevin mayer basically doing his like um you know performative something something and like saying oh well so long as i have a head of social good partnerships and impact and um what you know i'm i'm on the side of the angels okay well uh thank you for asking that is can we uh, end on a positive note <laughs> no no there's there's really nothing positive in the world <laughs> all right well the one thing that's positive is that you came on uh lindsay nakruma that's a positive thing i think their magazine's gonna do well and you know it's entrepreneurs you know we you know what well, uh, entrepreneur is just you know i, I like i i you know I, i've always been a little bit suspicious about this valorization of entrepreneurs it's a very american thing um like fast company in, every every there, company. there's there's a lot of like in 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 the development world there's a lot of talk about quote unquote micro entrepreneurs um yes. but but a lot of entrepreneurship and and one of the reasons why you do see a lot of entrepreneurship in like you know the black community and all of this kind of stuff is precisely that it's what you do if you can't get a job right i mean most people especially in this country they really like things like health insurance you know, they like job stability. They like knowing that they can make their mortgage payments for the next few years without having to worry about where that money is coming from. Like jobs, steady jobs and employment are like wonderful things and they're good things. And like good, like especially like unionized jobs with job security are good things. And like I think we should be valorizing like good union jobs more than we should be valorizing entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship is basically shit, I can't get a good job with job security. I'm going to have to like, you know, do this all on myself and take a huge amount of risk onto myself, which I don't necessarily want to take, right? Yeah, of course, there's not a, a, a possibility that I'm going to wind up making millions of dollars and that would be awesome. But like, I would actually quite happily give up that possibility of making millions of dollars if I knew that I would be able to make rent for the rest of my life. And so that's, 
that like having having good employment um prospects is much more important than entrepreneurship i think interesting well i mean the whole notion of entrepreneurship and when everybody was on the cover of fast company like it was vogue and they were showing a celebrity uh basically started and uh you know, during and right after the financial crisis, because most millennials couldn't get jobs, so they kind of took it in their own hands. And 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 like, if you look at the sort of um, the classic sort of demographic makeup of the valorized entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, um, it's generally like childless white guys on the one hand. You know, it's it's people like um, you know anyone from. Mark Zuckerberg to Bill Gates who like drop out of university and start a company when they have nothing to lose and no real responsibilities and no families to support or anything like that. So they can take those risks or else it's um, people who've made a bunch of money already in Silicon Valley through like stock options or whatever. And they've got, they've, they've got lucky. And so now they have enough of a financial cushion to be able to go out and, and take those risks. And there is, it's an inherently highly risky thing to do. And, yeah, sure. If you have no children, if you have like no dependents, if you have no parents who you need to support, and if you have, you know, none of those worries, um, or if you have so much money that that kind of thing doesn't matter, then entrepreneurship looks quite attractive. It's like a lot of upside and the downside is relatively small. But for most people, that's not the case. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see what happens now because a lot of entrepreneurs are definitely out of business now. Uh, so they're going to want to look for jobs. They're going to be fewer jobs. So they might have to be entrepreneurs, but there's no money. So uh, it's going to be an interesting, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens in that whole conversation. Anyway, Felix, thank you. Thank you for your time. Everybody uh, read Axios because you get to hear Felix and other like-minded journalists uh, who believe in smart brevity and it really helps you get a great sense of the world. Thank you for doing that. And uh, Lindsay Nakruma, uh, thank you. Oh, thanks Jarvis, he just uh, sent everybody. Also Jarvis, give uh, Felix's Twitter handle because you know he's on it all the time. Uh, Nakruma and Lindsay, thank you very much. Uh, again, everybody, thanks for coming to uh, the Zykai Culture Class. We have four, no, we have five more in the summer semester next week. Uh, we have, we're having Roxana Meron, who is a, a leading cardiologist and professor at Mount Sinai. And she isn't just going to just talk about COVID and its impact on hospitals and the world, uh, but also about uh, heart disease that doesn't get enough uh, coverage in the press um, in women, you know, women who have heart attacks, as well as a high rate of heart attacks of uh, black and brown people. So uh, she's going to talk about all those things and the future of healthcare. And uh, I hope it'll continue to illuminate. And so we could all keep learning. And I'm blessed that this community keeps growing. And again, thanks, Felix. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Nakuruma. And uh, subscribe to Axios and get Crown Magazine. I'll see you next week, Wednesday, 2 p.m., same time. Bye.